David, are you happy to start? Ready when you are, Kate. Yes, go ahead. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining um, our online talk with David Crystal. Um, I hope you're all keeping safe and well. And um, you enjoy this talk about John Bradburn and his poetry by David Crystal. Take it away, David. Thank you, Kate. Well, good evening, if you're in this time zone. Uh, possibly good afternoon somewhere. Maybe even good morning somewhere else. Who knows? You can never tell with, with Zoom who is anywhere. It could be anywhere in the world, couldn't it? But evening here, and I'm speaking to you from my uh, home in North Wales, in my study, with a few JB books uh, behind to add a bit of uh, context and atmosphere. And it's about the poetry. So let's begin with a poem. One of the favourites. Many people choose this as a favourite. Uh, indeed, we, do you remember, Kate, we read this one at Celia's uh, funeral. It was uh, so, it's so popular. This is Love, 1971, Love. Just the first part of it, the first stanza. Love is a short disease, a long desire, a strong and lasting healing. Love is like an angler landing fish, a hand at lyre, a road hog flogging home his motorbike. Love is a deep, unsleeping thing, leaps time and steeps amidst eternity for rest. And love is like three candles lighting rhyme and metre I am making for the best. An alleluiatic sequence shows a little of love's eloquence that lasts. Love has three lights. One to another glows, a third proceeds between. Naught overcasts true love, because it knows that it possesses, being possessed, a zest above distresses. That's the end of the first stanza. I love that final line, being possessed a zest above distresses. Think of the alliterations and the assonances there. Any poet would kill to have a line like that, it seems to me. And that poem is full of them. Well, yes, the most prolific poet ever. That's how he's often described. And as far as if you don't know the poems particularly well, or this is your first encounter with them, you should know that, yes, John is the most prolific poet that the English language has ever had. A point, a claim recognised by Guinness World Records. Uh, let's quantify it, you see. If you put him in comparison with the famous poets of the past, uh, John Milton, for instance, wrote about 20,000 lines of wonderful poetry. Wordsworth wrote about 50,000 lines of poetry. Shakespeare, depending on how you count his poems and his plays, wrote about 80 or 90,000 lines of poetry. And he held the record, really. John Bradburn wrote 173,486 lines of poetry. I mean, come on, <laughs> keep up, you other guys. <laughs> That's 5,300 poems so far. I say so far because there may be more out there, you know. As some of you know, he used to write poems all the time, verse letters to his friends, to his parents, to everybody. And at the time, some people may have received a verse letter and read it and enjoyed it and replied to it and then put it in a drawer or somewhere and forgot all about it. And every now and then we do get some, don't we, Kate? Some come through and uh, uh, they add to the database. So as I say, 5,300 so far. And the themes. The themes are enormous, very, very wide. There are over 50 different themes of poetry in the database. Most of them, of course, are spiritual, as you'd expect. Uh, about half the poems are about the Trinity or about Mary. But over and above that, 
the remainder go all over the place. There are many poems about the Bible, for instance, Old and New Testaments, huge number of poems about nature, birds and bees, a lot of poems about England, traveling around England, and then traveling abroad to India, Middle East, and so on, Israel. A lot of poems about Shakespeare. And of course, a considerable number of poems about Mutemwa and the lepers there and the local politics of the situation, which were, was at the time very, very difficult. So he would write a poem about it. So over 50 themes of that kind in the poetry as a whole, very versatile, very diverse. Not many poets have such a diverse range of themes in their work. And John is above all, to my mind, a human poet. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that some poets uh, write about very highfalutin topics, very intellectual, very, very, very abstract. John does, of course, with the spiritual poems, it get, does get very highfalutin, very abstract, very difficult at times to understand, but the vast majority of poems are very easy to understand. And he is a very human poet in the sense that he writes poems about the things that you and I deal with every day. He writes poems about the joys of tea and coffee, for instance, or brandy, hmm? or about the television and what a nuisance it is, or the telephones and what a nuisance it is, even false teeth, uh, even constipation. Well, I mean, you know, that's part of the human condition as well. And if he's having trouble in that direction, he writes a poem about it. Well, that I think is a first in the history of English poetry. I don't know of any other poet that ever wrote a poem about going to the toilet, ever. There may be one somewhere or other. That's what I mean by him being a human poet. He covers that enormous range from the highest to the lowest. And as we all know, at the moment, his cause for beatification is slowly trundling along. And we hope that within the not too distant future, he'll become a, a saint of, of what? A patron saint. Gosh, yes. How do you decide which saint, which, who he's going to patronize, as it were? The poems give us an indication. So many of the poems are about poverty, about the lepers in particular. The lepers are not just lepers, they're there as a symbol of all the poor and the marginalized. He generalizes from them to the situation of the poor as a whole. So he could join Father Damien, maybe, as a patron saint of lepers, or somehow a saint of the poor and the marginalized. That would be one direction. Or to take another, he is such an ecumenist. I mean, these days where the world is full of religious differences and terrorism and, well, we all know we need a counter to that. And the ideal counter is somebody who was able to reach into all these different religious traditions and use them in the poems and be proud of them all and bring them together. That long poem of his, 10,000 lines long, called Ut Unum Sint, that they may all be one, illustrates the range, the way in which he dips into different religious traditions and makes them all inform each other. Well, you'd expect that, wouldn't you? Somebody raised in the Church of England, then converted to Catholicism, then spent some time in India, so he knows all about Hinduism and Buddhism, and then in Africa with Islam, and then Judaism, of course, often signed himself in his uh, letters, John Bradburn, Jew, for instance. Christ was a Jew, you know. He's all of this he brings together. He sees the good side of all religious traditions. And we long for ecumen ecumenical peace and peace generally. So he could be a patron saint of peace, maybe, and then a third big theme is the environment. Oh, isn't that a theme these days? Saving the planet. We're all worried about this situation. Well, he was there first. You know, the word ecology as a word 
ecosystem, all that sort of thing, didn't really start com coming into English in a popular way until the 1970s. The Oxford English Dictionary has a first recorded use of ecology in its sense of concern for the environment, only in the 1970s. John was writing poems about this in the 1960s. And he criticizes himself at times for his explosive temperament, for his anger. And what made him angry? Two big things made him angry. One was if somebody harmed his lepers, directly or indirectly, that made him furious. And the other was if somebody harmed the environment by cutting down trees or whatever it might be, that made him furious as well. And so he writes poems about deforestation and about plastic. I mean, you know, we're into plastic now. He was into plastic and worried about it and condemning the use of plastic back in the 70s. So these are some of the big themes. An apostle for peace, for the poor, for the environment. Which way is it going to go? I don't know, but there are so many possible directions. Well, such a wide oeuvre of poetry. The question I often get asked when I talk about the poems is always, is it any good then? If you write so much, it can't all be good, can it? Well, no, of course it can't. And he recognized this himself. Yes, thinking of it as a, as a kind of academic literary critic, the poems go from the most brilliant to the most doggerel-like. And he recognized this. Indeed, he had strong feelings about the quality of his poetry, so much so that he burned a lot of it. Heaven knows how much there was originally before he started to burn some of it. There's a letter to his mother which says, you know, dear mum, you know, take that folder that you, you know where it is and burn the stuff in it because it's no good. But on the whole, I would say about 90% of the poems are quality poems, poems that any poet would be proud to have written. And he wanted to be read. He was proud of his poetry, quite rightly so. He says at one point at the end of a poem about Shakespeare, it was, my age is 53, my lines are many, and almost all of them not read by any. The two of the saddest lines in the entire oeuvre, actually. But not anymore, John, not anymore. I mean, people are reading your stuff all over the place now. Apart from the themes, what you see in the poetry is an impressive technical skill. The poem I read at the beginning, and you'll hear another one later, uh, it's full of rhyme, of clever meter, of alliteration, of assonance, often acrostics at the beginning, over and above the content of the poem, the actual technical putting together of the text is extraordinarily skillful. And given the circumstances in which he worked, it's amazing that he was able to do this. Now, what's the biggest problem if you're out in Rhodesia in the 1960s and 70s, wanting to write poetry? finding paper to write it on. It's not at all easy. He was continually having difficulty finding paper. So he wrote poems wherever he could. You see them all over the place, on the backs of envelopes, on a packing uh, piece of packing paper you know, envelope that you'd send stuff in. He has a book and, oh, lovely, at the beginning of the book, there's a blank page. So he writes a poem on the blank page of the book. There are airmail letters. He's got a lot of airmail letters. So he writes poems on the airmail letters. Look, I've, I've got one here. I'll show it to you. Here it is. There's a typical blue airmail letter. Now, you won't be able to read it, but look how the poem starts at the top and down it goes and down it goes and down it goes. And it finishes perfectly at the bottom. And if you didn't know that it was written on an airmail letter, you'd think, what a fantastic poem this is. But somehow or other, he managed to anticipate the structure of this poem so that it would finish perfectly at the bottom of the page. Try doing that sometime. 
You'll see how difficult it is. But he did this over and over and over. It's quite extraordinary. Or to take another example. At one point, he managed to get himself a supply of stencils. Now, stencils is an old technology, but you know, in the old days, you'd get a stencil and you'd run off copies after copy after copy after copy, which of course he did. So we've got multiple copies of many of the works. Well, here's a stencil. You know, there's that sort of typical Ronio top that you put on the machine. So there it is. All right, that's blank. So he puts that in his typewriter and he starts to write, well, in this particular case, two poems. And he writes them so that the first one ends halfway down and the second one ends at the bottom. You see? There's the first poem, and there's the second, and it ends perfectly at the bottom of the page. And do you see any typing errors in there? No, you don't. There isn't a single typing error in the whole thing. And that is typical. I mean, how can you do that? Many of us write poems. I write poems, or used to. I've got two poetry books out. For any one poem, I remember I'd write a line, cross it out, no, nah, that's no good. Change it, add a bit, no, nah, that's no good. Do another bit, add a bit on. Once, just for an exercise, as I was writing a fairly short poem of about 12 lines, I thought I would record every change I made, because you can do this on the computer easily. So every time I made a change, I, I memorized that page. By the time that 12 line poem was finished, there were 400 records of the stages through which I wrote the poem. John just did it, just straight out like that. And in his handwritten stuff, you see the same sort of thing. That long poem I mentioned, At Unum Sint, 10,000 lines long in a book, very big book. And you go page after page after page, and you see his lovely copper plate handwriting down up every page, every page. You can go for dozens of pages and not see a single crossing out or change of thought. And all the rhymes are there, and the meter is there, and the verse structure is there. It is quite remarkable. The poetry database, of course, isn't just poems. Um, there are prose uh, material, there's prose material there as well. Uh, for instance, his diaries, we put those up. Many of his letters, only the letters that have something significant, not the letters that just say, you know, hello, mum, it's a lovely day here, end, sort of thing. No, uh, we didn't put those up. They're available, of course, for anybody to see at the John Bradburn um, site. It's, uh, Kate's got them somewhere, I think. Uh, but, you know, online, we put anything that talks more generally about life, the universe, and everything. So there's quite a bit of prose there. And then, of course, these days, we were able to put them on the, the database. Uh, the database is now online. You may or may not have seen it. If not, here it is. JohnBradburnPoems.com. And if you've not been there, go. It's fun. It sucks you in. Once you're in, it might take you a while before you get out. Let me show you how it works. Uh, you can go to search for a poem there, you see, um, at that particular point. Click on it and up comes the box. And then you can type in there the name of any particular poem. So let's say we've got short disease. That, we, that I read at the beginning, and you click on search, and uh, then up will come. It always takes a, 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 a minute if, um, depending upon the, the nature of the link, if I'm, I'm using up all the bandwidth at the moment, but still, there it is. So there are three poems there now, three poems which contain the phrase short disease, and one of them I read at the beginning. So you can use the search, it's, uh, it's a very easy thing to use. Uh, all the poems are there in alphabetical order, A, B, C, D, up to Z. So you can either search for them or, or look for an individual poem but through the letters of the alphabet. Or, and this is rather clever, you can go to advanced search 
And on advanced search on the next page, if you scroll down, there is a heading theme, theme. And in there are all the themes. So if you click on that, you get a long list of themes. And now if you want, for example, to find all the poems that are to do with say, India or Middle East or Trinity or Mary or whatever, you just click on that theme and up comes all the poems that deal with that particular theme. This is very useful, especially for people who are interested in a particular aspect of John's poetry. At the top also, there's an important where to start heading over on the right there. Um, and where to start is of course the biggest problem for many people. I mean, what do you do with, you've got 5,000 poems and you want to start reading John, you don't want to begin with letter A and go all the way through. No, no, you need a way of sorting it. Well, one way of course is to look at some of the anthologies that we've done that are available through the JBMS at the moment. Uh, Songs of the Vagabond, the blue one there, is the one we did first, which is a kind of introduction to an array of the poems. Um, you know, different, a few examples of each of the main themes. And then later we did uh, Birds, Bees and Beasts, which is all about the fauna and flora. And then another one, John Bradburn on love, because so many of the poems are about different aspects of love. Uh, John Bradburn's Mutemwa, a, uh, a guide to the actual village in poems and, and uh, prose. And actually on the database, I didn't mention this before, there's a couple of other things as well. If uh, I go to that poem again, Love is a Short Disease, um, we've done two things over the last few years. One is to add uh, a great deal of visual content to the site. Uh, every poem has been scanned so that you can actually see the individual text um, that the original text, like the ones I showed you with the, uh, with the letter just a little while ago. And also we've added audio to an extent. Now, Anne Lander, of course, has already done an absolutely fantastic CD, which I hope you've seen, and if you haven't, do get hold of it, which illustrates many of the examples of John reading his poems and singing and so on, and we'll perhaps hear a little bit of that from Kate uh, at the end of the talk. But in addition to that, Kate managed to get together all the examples of audio that we have available, um, all kinds of different qualities of sound and everything like that. I mean, some of it's quite good, some of it's not so good, but it's still <laughs> wonderful to hear his lovely cultured voice uh, singing and chanting and, and reading the poems. And um, the, uh, all these audio files are now available on the website. Um, you, you go to a particular uh, text well, I was searching for one just before and I've lost it now, but it'll come back in a minute. Excuse me a second. It'll come up in just a second. And the, the reason why we actually did all the scans was because as part of the cause, it's important to have every piece of John's writing available uh, for the theologians to actually read and check that everything's okay as far as the uh, canonization process is concerned. Oh, there we are, it's come up now. So here we are, you see, there's that love poem again. You see on the right, there's a little uh, piece of text there. If I click on that, up comes the original typed version that he himself typed, you see. So there's one of those on almost every page. We don't have copies of absolutely everything, but we've got copies of about 99% of it. And then on the left, we've got the, an audio clip, if, there's, uh, if there is an audio 
version available, you'll be able to click on that as well. So if you want to get into John's poetry in more detail, then where to start, go to the where to start section of the website and it will give you the contents of all the books I've just been mentioning. And you can either check those up online or get hold of a copy from the JBMS. Um, if you want something a bit more, uh, a bit more heavyweight, as it were, you can go to my book, which is also available through the JBMS, uh, My Life in Words, um, A Life Made of Words, Poetry and Thought of John Bradburn. This is more a kind of critical, uh, literary critical and stylistic account of the poetry. Uh, so that's available. And then the other thing you can do, of course, is simply read the individual poems and read them aloud. You know, he writes poetry not just to be read, but to be heard. Do you remember, you know, being possessed, a zest above distresses? I mean, that is just amazing to, to be heard, not just read. And indeed, next year, uh, you'll be able to hear a fair number of people reading material of this kind. Kate has this, had this uh, lovely idea of leading up to the 100th anniversary of the birth in June to have 100 days of po poetry reading, 100 days leading up to that 100th, uh, that, that moment. So there'll be a poem a day. I've selected the poems and sent them to Kate and Kate has circulated them. And some of you, I think, already have chosen a poem that you'd like to read on a particular day. Roger McGough is going to start us off. People may know Roger from his poetry, please, uh, on, the, uh, on the radio and uh, other programs. And of course, a great favorite uh, amongst lit in literary festivals. Uh, good old friend of mine. We went to the same school, actually, once upon a time, Christian Brothers School. So uh, you'll be able to hear an awful lot of the poetry in the 100 days leading up to the uh, uh, anniversary. So one more thing before I stop. I mean, the idea was for me to talk for half an hour and then we could have a bit of discussion and question time and things like that. And I thought I would end with, um, well, my favorite poem actually, although you might not expect it to be this one. See, when I talked about themes, one category I didn't mention was jocular themes. John had a remarkable sense of humour. Those of you who know him will be able to report on this afterwards if you like, um, but it comes across over and over and over in the poetry. Even sometimes with a very serious poem, he's got his tongue in his cheek, you can sense it. And sometimes he just writes a crazy poem, a surreal poem, a poem where it's just absurd. But it's so funny sometimes. And I thought I'd end with one of those. Actually, the way I read it, I've changed the final lines um, to, make them, to make it easier to read aloud. The, you see the original on the website. I haven't cha changed the sense, just added a, a rhyme, which I'm sure he would have delighted in to hear it. And this is the one about false teeth that I mentioned at the beginning. Some of you know it, I'm sure. I've read it several times at various events, but I love this one. False teeth. There sat a man at dinner and a vittel broke his plate. Sat next to him a thinner, whispered, not to scratch your pate. I've got one in my pocket, which I feel you'll find will fit. He dived for it as he connived in secret proffered it, and lo, it was the height of taste, and right as well. Fell to in haste, and right the fellow, for a further course was following. He had to force until he broke replacement rare, and thought, it really isn't fair. But, saith the breath next door, there, there, I've got another nigh the same. 
passed it the hand. The hand did claim another winner. What's your name? And what profession, may I ask, that you carry supplies for such a task? You're not perchance a false teeth maker? No, no, said he. I'm an undertaker. Ain't it a punchline? <laughs> That's my favourite. Anyway, there we are, Kate. Um, if you want to... Uh, Thank you, David. ...take over at this point and... Uh, that was wonderful. I'll answer some questions in a moment, but yeah. um, you've got something to share with us. Yeah, has anybody got any questions for David about John or poetry or anything um, David's talked about? Please unmute yourself and ask away. Mm. Oh, well, um, Gavin Young, can you hear me, David? Uh, yes, I can, Gavin. Um, uh, it, comparisons are invidious, but it, uh, it's impossible for me not to not to do it. Partly because he was a convert from uh, Anglicanism, as I am myself. Um, uh, but I keep thinking of Hopkins. Yeah. Uh, part partly, of course, it, it's the spiritual aspect. But you suddenly you, it reminded me when you talked about the trees being felled and those Binsey poplars, um, which Hopkins writes of, and also his insistence that it should be read out loud, not quietly to yourself, which I think Hopkins also said that you must you must actually do it out loud. Um, Quite right. And indeed, this point has been recognised. In fact, the Hopkins Society of Ireland invited me over, oh, in 2012, I think it was, to give a talk about John, comparing him to Hopkins. Um, and uh, I wrote a paper about it, and it's available if anybody wants to read it. It's on my website, uh, davidcrystal.com. You can read it there. Um, and the discussion was entirely about the parallels that you quite rightly mentioned, Gavin, not just in terms of themes, uh, but in terms of, you know, the alliteration that they both use and all sorts of uh, similarities. So yes, a big, big parallel uh, over and above the, the background of the two um, and their thematic interests. Now, it's not just Hopkins. Uh, lots of other people have been, um, I was up at a conference in Durham last year, uh, where people were talking about, you know, Catholic poetry and its traditions. And people who know far more about this than me, because I'm, I'm not a professional literary historian, I'm a linguist. Um, and people who were, were saying, you know, there are parallels here with George Herbert, for instance, the metaphysical poet from the 17th century. And just uh, last year, I was in touch with um, uh, somebody who has been uh, writing a book on John Henry Newman. And Newman, of course, wrote quite a bit of poetry as well, as well as his prose. And we were comparing notes about that. And Newman, too, was such a human poet. I mean, some of his everyday illusions and the way, the idioms that he uses and the down-to-earth way in which he talks about difficult themes. To this, uh, Peter Connolly, this is a priest from the, in the Midlands, he said that there are all sorts of parallels between the two of them. Um, and so I think as people get to know John's poetry more and bring it into the context of their own favourite poetry of the past and their own favourite poets, I think we're going to see more and more. And I'm not surprised because John himself was an avid reader. Mm. And in Ut Unum Sint, he imagines a procession going past of, well, all sorts of people, composers and artists and poets. And it's quite clear that he had read widely in all kinds of poetic contexts, not modern poetry, didn't like that. Didn't like free verse, oh no, very against free verse. So you don't get any references to T.S. Eliot or anything like that, but anything a bit more traditional, and wow, he was a full, re and of course Shakespeare, um, he, he knew every Shakespeare play and, and uh, quotes frequently from them. And so, yes, I'd expect there to be more and more relationships of that kind come to light as time goes by. Thank you. Hi, David. Hi, Hello. who's there? Portia, yes. Yes, it's Portia. 
Uh, can you say at what point in his lifetime did he make he, most of his poems? I would be very much interested to know it, which parts of his life. Yes, well, um, the, very, the earliest poem we have is a piece of uh, doggerel, as it were, that he wrote when he was in school, um, but just a few lines and, um, you know, of no significance whatsoever except biographical. Then he didn't write anything. Um, he starts to write when he comes back from the war, really, and you start getting a few poems in the late 1940s, uh, written in all kinds of strange situations in exercise books and school text books of one kind and another. Quite interesting stuff. In 1949, he wrote a number of poems about um, birds and bees and things, some of which have stood the test of time. And you'll see them in, the, in one of the books there. Uh, but very sporadic, um, really. Uh, in the late 1950s, after a lot of traveling about and uncertainty and going to various monasteries and things like this to work out what his vocation was going to be, um, he first starts sitting in a hermitage in Devon, really, I think, uh, to start writing some serious poetry. And we get a lot of poems in 1957, 58, 59, uh, written in England. And then there's a lull, and then he ends up in Rhodesia. And at that point, the lid goes off. Uh, and you get, in the 1960s, a slow and steady build-up, more and more poems being written, despite the difficult times, and even in the very difficult times in the 70s, nonetheless, he manages to write sometimes, you know, 10 poems a day at times. So it's the 70s that are the, the bulk of the poems. About, I suppose about half the poems are written in the 70s, about a third of them written in the 60s, and then the rest sort of spread over the earlier period. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll be very pleased to read some of the, a lot of them, because to be honest, I think that's one thing unique about uh, Zimbabweans, because uh, you can sit among Zimbabweans and speaking the same language, but when they start speaking poetry, you won't be able to catch any part of the conversation. <laughs> and it can go on and on and they'll be laughing and you are oh. there as long as you cannot get the gist of it. You will never get what they're talking about. <laughs> no, abso absolutely. I mean, it is the case that most African cultures have an oral tradition of poetry that is much stronger and much mm. more rich than anything that came out of the, out of the West. Um, and I've, I've met several uh, poets from Africa over the years and listened to them and been to a couple of, um, you know, poetry slams, as they say. And you're quite right. <laughs> they go on and on and on and everybody's enjoying themselves so much, you know, enjoying poetry. That's the thing. You know, a lot of people think, you know, poetry, oh, poetry. Mm, yes, very serious. You know, you can't sort of enjoy it. It's very, it's very important, of course. Mm -hmm. No, poetry is there to be enjoyed. Um, and John enjoyed what he was doing. You can tell from the way that he writes that he enjoyed every line. Otherwise, he just wouldn't have got that that versatility, that, that playfulness. Oh yes, that's a word I haven't used so far this evening. His playfulness. He loves to play. And why does he love to play with language? Because he says, God has a sense of humor. God laughs. Now this is really quite a striking thing to say, you know, because there's no actual evidence of God laughing on earth. Jesus never laughs anywhere. Uh, he cries. We're told he weeps, but he, no indication that he ever laughed, but he must have done, as far as John's concerned. And he has this on best authority, because uh, he, would, he, he asserts that Mary told him uh, that, that laughter is the, is the norm for the angels and everybody. And so he, he puts that, that playfulness, that ludicity, into his work in the most noticeable kind of way. And I think it therefore ties in very much so with the joyfulness that you see in the African poetic tradition. 
Thank you. Thank you. David, am, am I, can I? Oh. Who's, I? who's there next? Anthony, was oh, it? Or was it okay. just... Can you hear me, David? Yes, I can. Yeah, thank you very much for, for the talk. Uh, it's wonderful. Um, thinking about the post-canonization, you know, um, um, he's obviously, you mentioned Damien of Molokai, so we've already got a patron saint of lepers. His vagabond nature makes him very close to a great French saint called Saint Benoit Labre. Uh, it was a tramp. It was a, 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 a tramp. And of course, his trolling round monasteries as a kind of girovag makes him very close to Charles de Foucault, you know, who was murdered in Taman Rasset in Algeria. Wow. But um, thinking back to the wonderful mass that the society organized in Westminster Cathedral. Um, I don't know whether you remember, I'm sure you will remember, in the middle of the, of the cathedral were two officers from the Gurkha Regiment, hmm. uh, who I chatted to. I was, I'd never seen their uniforms before, you know, and I, I got an idea why they were there. I said, oh, you're here because of John serving in the Gurkhas, are you? And yet they said, oh yeah, okay. hmm. so obviously. I'm thinking, were he to be made pa patron saint of the Gurkhas, <laughs> it would surely be the first regiment of the British army, or indeed any other army, with a patron saint. And why can't he also become, if we haven't got one, because I'm an amateur hagiographer, not a professional hagiographer, uh, why can't he be made patron saint of poetry, of poems? Sorry, poet. Oh, you're, you're absolutely right. And do of course, we, do we have a, there's, there's no, no patron need. saint of poets or something? Yeah, okay. Have we got one? If we haven't got one, then he must become one. Yeah, well, that's a very good idea. Uh, of course, you can have more than one saint. Per of topic, course you can, of course you can. But um, Didier, uh, the parallels with the, the French examples there, do you have a comment on that? Unmute yourself. <laughs> uh, you say the parallel with? with well, the... for, 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 for uh, lepers, of, well, uh, ah, Damien, sorry. of course, is Belgian. Uh, the two French I was thinking of are the uh, vagabonds. Yeah. We have, uh, is it Joseph Benoit Labre? Yeah. And uh, of course, uh, for um, Girovag, that's yeah. men in their life trolling round different monasteries, being thrown out of all of them as okay. being... Okay, uh, what do you, what do you it's think? It's Charles de Foucault. Yeah. The, the parallel with uh, uh, Saint Benoit Joseph Labre and uh, nearly Saint uh, Charles de Foucault yeah. uh, was made uh, as soon as uh, 1052 by uh, the responsible of in Louvain uh, oh, for the father yeah. of Sion. Uh, when John decided to leave and, and to, to go to Holy Land, and he wrote a letter on which it's written, he is a kind of Saint Joseph Benoit Labre <laughs> from Foucault. So yes. that's, it yes. was in 1952. So yes. nearly All right. Years ago. Thank you. Thank yes. you. So Teresa, you were, you were trying to get in before, I think. Were, were yes. You? yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. David, thank you. It's, it's lovely to see you all. You know, I was just going to say, did you know that um, our mother, I think Erica's also listening to this, um, Audrey, John's little sister, was also very passionate about poetry and music. And at one time, I think it must have been in the 60s, late 60s, yes, late 60s, that she was asked to do... A, a, um, a program on the Kenya radio for poetry. And what she did, was she put music to poetry. So, you know, it's lovely to hear John singing his poetry and singing, uh -huh. but my mother, Tiggy Audrey, would um, loved, loved the poetry side, but also the classical music side. And she combined the two. And so John and she shared the passion of, of poetry and oh, music. Yes. 
Yes, yes, how interesting. And of course, uh, some of you might not know this, but there are a number of poems where John thinks of a piece of music yeah. and writes the poem so that it actually reflects the rhythm of the music. The Bach fugue, for example, you know, da, 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 yeah. one. There's a yeah. poem which actually follows the themes, the, 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 the rhythm and the sequence all the way through from beginning to end. Quite right. extraordinary. That's yeah. quite amazing. Yeah, so bringing the two together, um, yeah. I mean, he, 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 he obviously loved classical music. Yes, indeed. I mean, we've got so many poems in which he refers to different pieces. He loved Bach in particular. Yes, my mother too. She also loved C.S. Lewis. I mean, that was her favourite. Ah. Yeah. Right. I think that, that John and Audrey were very similar in that way. And well, their faith, they? of course, yes. Ah, oh, thank you. Yes. Now I had, no, now I had something all. about John as patron for poets. Uh, a, a good uh, 20th century British theologian, uh, Robert Murray, uh, wrote about Saint Ephraim, the harp of the spirit, that he was a good theologian because he was a good poet, and he was a good poet because he was a good theologian. And I think this definition fits very well also for John. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. <laughs> Perfect parallel, indeed. How are we doing? Any questions more up there? Or comments? Kate, for you perhaps? Um, hello, yes. Oh, no. Somebody here? Yes, it's myself. Dave. Hello, hello, Kate. Um, I've, I've mentioned this to Kate before, but I've got, I don't know whether you can see this. No, it won't show. But I've got here um, a score um, for the wonderful 1949 poem, I Do Not Follow Thee, O Lord, uh, which happens to be my absolute favourite. Um, I've got a score here written by a wonderful guy called John Legrove, who is a teacher at Cheatham's Music College in Manchester. Um, he gave me this as a gift. Uh, I've yet to hear it or yet to find a way of actually getting it uh, performed so I can hear what it's like. I'm not a, whilst I'm an avid music person, I'm not a musician. Um, it's, um, it's subtitled Short Anthem for Unaccompanied um, uh, Soprano, Alto, uh, Tenor and Bass Choir. Um, if any of you have got any wonderful suggestions on where I could send this score to have it looked at by a person much more knowledgeable and clever than myself. I would love to send it and have somebody have a serious look at it. Mm, thank you. What an interesting idea. The only, the only pe poem of John's that, that was set professionally, to my knowledge, Kate, you may know more about this than me, uh, was the poem that was done at the proms in 20. 10 was it or 2011 um something like that didier do you remember exactly I remember the year but i think there was also one before was there yeah uh, i don't have year, but <laughs> yeah but anyway it's only been done once or uh, evidently twice um and uh certainly this is a very good good idea i mean anybody who's got a thought about this let kate know yeah let kate know because kate obviously has contact details for me, so I can send, in fact, Kate, have I sent this score to you? I can't remember. No, no, David. So send it to me, because I might know a few people who might be able to help. Okay, Kate. well, I'll, I'll send the score to you later anyway. Yeah. Just, just off the top of my head, um, we have a national body an official body of the Catholic Church in the United Kingdom called the Society of St. Gregory, oh, yeah. where the chairman, a secretary, and whatever, a very good, big annual conference. But that consists of hundreds of people involved in church music. Mm -hmm. And surely someone in the Society of St. Gregory would point you in the right direction. Mm. Uh, Ah, thank you, Anthony. Yes, that's you know, an interesting thought. We have the Royal College of Church Music, uh, which is not Catholic, but extremely, you know, 
that's the heavy cross they'll have to bear, they uh, <laughs> would also help you out, I'm sure. And every diocese, of course, um, every diocese has um, a director of music. Each one of our cathedrals has uh, a high-powered organist and choir director. So there's lots of people you can vamp. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Anthony. I'm, yes, I'm, an interesting idea. Yeah. I'm just mindful of the fact that I don't want to see the score go too far away from the John Bradburn Memorial Trust, uh, Society. Mm. Um, I want to, um, uh, I hope that Kate agrees with me, but I'd just like to keep it fairly close to the society. Is it, is it copyright? Uh, no. Um, get it, make it copyright. Okay. Yeah, well, we can do that easily by yeah. via the society, of course, because yeah. all the, all the poems, for example, are copyright to the society. And okay, then, well, what 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 I'll do? I'll send this to Kate, yeah. and Kate, if I could ask you to sure. make this copyright, I'd be most grateful. Of course, thank you, David. Once it's copyright, then it can never be performed without a fee being paid to the John Bradburn Memorial Society. Yeah, good. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I think you wanted to say something. Yeah, you're unmuted. Yeah, I can, we can hear you, Anne. Can you hear me, David? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. David, I'm just going way back to, um, to little anecdotes you gave about John and his work and typing writing and all of that sort of situation. And I got, he got me quite involved, as he did, and I had orders, frequently orders, for the stencils that you showed so well. Those had to be done and kept in a box. Not one had to be a box, uh, which he would do very well. But the other thing he would all, I quite often ask for his paper, which is what you said. And I managed to get him quite a bit of the paper, typewriting paper, as you will see from his poems yeah. on that. So that was also a request. He was very firm and definite about what he needed to do carry out his poetry. Then the next thing is ribbons. You know that funny I typewriter he has. And I managed to get those as well. But one occasion I sent him the multicolored one, red and, and black. And he was furious. He said, I can't use this. I have to I have one color, one color alone with no red in it. But there's a I think some of the which show some bit of red typing as well. I think it shows up. Well he didn't like that. So I was given very strict orders, and um, which I had to carry it out. But he then showed me one day um, his tin chest. I don't know if you remember it in the corner, to the left-hand side before he went out of the door. And he wanted me to see this. It was a bit better. He'd been given it because of the worry and concern about his paper being eaten by termites, which of course was a real threat. So everything had to be put in this tin trunk. I don't know where the key was. I think that was in the ark somewhere. And he, he said, that is the most important, precious thing. He said, that has to be kept and my poems will be read. Mm. So important to him that his poems were safe and that they knew they would be read. That was his gift. Yeah. Lovely. Good. Thank thank you for that reminiscence, Anne. That's, that's absolutely lovely. You took me back. And yes. Interestingly, of course, despite his antipathy to the two-color two ribbon, he does occasionally uh, seem to control it in the sense that you get some lines in black and some in red. And it does seem as if uh, at a certain point he thought, hey, I might be able to play with this a little, you know. He doesn't do it very often, but he does do it from time to time. Yes, that wasn't what he wanted. Mm. Only but he did get rid of it because of my mistake. He forgave me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, David, for a, a, a wonderful talk. Into, oh, does someone else want to ask a question? Oh, yeah, Beatrice. So I was curious, um, back to Portia's question with regard to when he was writing some of his poems. And when he came back after, after fighting, do his poems at that time reflect some of the, the 
things that he would have seen and, and had to cope with and using poetry to, to deal with some of the, maybe some atrocities that he saw? No, this is the curious thing. No, there's hardly anything um, uh, about, about the war. It's as if he wanted to draw a line under it. Um, I, I've heard this um, many times from people who were uh, involved in fighting in the Second World War in particular, and they didn't talk about it to anybody, to their families, to anybody. They just clammed up. Um, and uh, there's just the occasional reference here and there, uh, more to the setting rather than to the actual horrible events of the war itself. So, no, nothing much there at all. It's not surprising. Surprising and yet understandable, really. So are we are we through? Oh no, there's one coming up there. Who's waving? Can't see the name. It's Jane. Oh hi Jane. Yes. Hello. First of all, thank you very much for my good pass from Reading University all those years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I'm, I'm working as a volunteer for Lepra, and Lepra India have gone back to Matemwa after many years. And um, I was looking at the pictures from there. And you could see that John was always to one side of the pictures and what she was doing was showing those with leprosy, but not their disabilities so much as what they can do. So for example, there's a, uh, a bugler blowing a bugle. Yeah. And um, some of his poems, you use the word hu that he was a very human poet. And some of his poems about those suffering from leprosy, they pull out names and they pull out different uh, features and they also talk about what he did with them and so he had a lovely simple rhymes so for example there was a child from a very good looking woman who had a child who was dumb and he wrote who was dumb and my chum and so and they used to go for, and they used to go for runs together and I was wondering as those poems about um, those suffering from leprosy where do they stand in his sort of overall things and what's your favorite one? Oh, um, uh, th they are a sequence uh, for the most part. There are occasional isolated poems about individuals, but the, but the main chunk of poetry is in two collections, one called a jumbly alphabet and the other a fumbly alphabet, if I remember correctly. And it's just one after the other, after the other, after he goes through every member of the community and yes. gives a poem to each of them. Um, and this is a first. I, I mean, nobody has ever yeah. done this before, least, least of all about a group of lepers. But I mean, you know, you, you just don't write poems about individuals and then sometimes more than one. So it's not that he has his favorites, but that there, there were some of the members of the community there who were so full of activity and ingenuity that he had, it gave him a lot to write about. My favorite is the one about uh, Timu, uh, T-I-M-U, Timu. Uh, Timo's no, Timu. Timu's no Timon, he starts off. That's Timon of Athens, you see, Shakespeare allusion straight away. Um, but he goes through the poem and talks about the eggs that Timu looks after and the chickens and things like that. And if you look that one up, um, you'll see the most fascinating thing, and that is, and you don't realize it until you finish the poem, and even then you might not realize it. But every letter of, of the first line is an acrostic uh, that goes all the way down like that. And if you read the acrostic down, it says, Time I went to bed <laughs> at the beginning of this poem about Timu. And that just illustrates A, a serious poem about, about this guy. Uh, a beautiful poem about this person, um, very illuminating, very sympathetic, uh, and yet at the same time so playful. And uh, it, it's that bringing together, it's the, jo the joy of working with these people, of being with these, he called them his friends. Um, and they were, they weren't just people he was caring for, they were his friends. And it, you see it in so many of those leprosy poems. They are on the whole pretty good, I think. I mean, it, insofar as you would judge all the poems from the most brilliant to the least brilliant, they are towards the most brilliant end, but they are of, the, of themselves. They are of a different kind from anything else. 
Um, they, uh, they are very personal, very vivid, very vivid. He, he doesn't he doesn't balk at saying you know this person has no leg or this person has no nose or whatever it is that's there in the poem as well and so you get a very vivid picture of the people he was with at the time thank you yeah Teresa yeah. about the lepers uh, I would like to add about oh, the sorry. lepers did he eat first yeah uh, thank you you know uh, yeah, something very wonderful about John. Uh, his patron Francis worked for lepers and lived with lepers as John did. But the only leper who, who, for whom Francis has worked is the one who was very bad for him. John, we have this treasury of knowledge, which is which has a very, uh, I would say, anthropological importance to to understand as he did that there are really human brothers, and sometimes more human than we are, and also that he was convinced, and he was he was right that several of them were saints. Yeah, and I would say would deserve also beatification, not only John. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very good point. Absolutely. Thank you, Didier. Teresa, you had your hand up, and then I suppose, Kate, we must call this a day because it's we've past our hour. But Teresa, what were you going to say? Yeah, thanks, David. I just wanted to ask you if you knew about... Uh, my. I, I'm one of four siblings. My younger brother is Charles, and he lives on Vancouver Island in Canada. And when John was killed um, two months later, my two brothers were in Canada. They went to John's brother, Michael, in Canada, and they ended up in British Columbia as, lumber, as loggers, lumberjacks. And um, Charles actually found out two months after John had died, and immediately he wrote a poem for John. And what reminded me of it was you saying time for bed, but Char Charlie's poem for John it was called Ode to John. I don't know if you've seen it, but in actual fact, if you look at it, it's also, it's, he's put it with, a, if you look on the side, it's Christ is King. Ah. And it's, it's beautiful because it was really so soon after John died. And um, I would be not, I don't know if you've seen it, but I can send it to you if you'd like it. No, I don't think I have. Uh, uh, oh, gosh, this happens all the time. You know, people come up with, New things. <laughs> no, by all means, please. But it's do. not John's poem. Yeah. Okay, it's not John's poem. It's my brother, no, no. John's nephew. No, but yeah. there, there is a kind of um, what's the word? Uh, larger family of literature or, or array of literature that is John orientated. Yes. Uh, written by various people, yes. and some of it, um, Bruce Wilkinson, for example. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, I, I don't have this, and it's not on the database, but um, you've got it all, haven't you, Kate, in your big collection down south, uh, all the stuff that was written, letters written to John, um, and, and then later about John, um, which uh, is, is also interesting, including, of course, a lot of biographical material, all his school reports, for instance, you've got, haven't you? Things like that, which are absolutely fascinating. You know, lovely to see, isn't it? An English teacher saying, you know, could do better, <laughs> and things of that <laughs> kind. <laughs> ah, well, well, look, it's just gone eight, and we must stop, I suppose. Kate, do you want to close this? Hey, David, um, we thought we'd just play you uh, the poem that... Uh, David started the talk with um, love. So I'm just going to put that on. Thank you, David, for the talk. Hope everybody enjoyed it. If yes, anybody would you. like to order any of bo the books that David's written behind him, um, please go on the JBMS website, the John Brabham Moore's website. Um, we've got them all available. And the Alive to God CD, which is what this poem is from. So I will play that now. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Love is a short disease, long desire 
is strong and lasting healing. Love is like an angler landing fish, a hand at lyre, a roadhog flogging home his motorbike. Love is a deep, unsleeping thing, leaps time and steeps in its eternity for rest. And love is like three candles lighting rhyme and meter I am making for the best. An anemiatic sequence shows a little of love's eloquence that lasts. Love has three lights, one to another glows, a third proceeds between. Naught overcasts true love because it knows that it possesses, being possessed, a zest above distresses. For as to the caress of lightsome love, steady as is unflickering a flame, no less is human that than is above proud condescension one divine we claim. The flame goes out alone to throne the fire of three that shall not ever be put out, even by my shortcoming in desire, not yet perpetual, beset by doubt. No mortal man should ever be retired from obligation to proceed in joy with loving, since by loving he was sired, and love may be immortally his joy. As honey is the sweetness of the bees, and wax the sealing of it, love doth please, and both can melt, and so may hearts with ease. Lovely, thank you. And that's on Anne's CD and on the website as well. Well, thank you, everybody. Stay safe, and lovely to talk to you all and see you all. Oh, thank Bye for you. now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.